Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Ashley, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Ashley. So when I was asked to uh, speak at this meeting... I uh, copped a quick resentment against Jose, um, just momentarily. I forgive you now. Uh, Yeah, this isn't my favorite thing to do, is get up in front of people and speak. Um, I struggle with panic disorder and panic attacks and anxiety, like, really bad. But when I first came into the rooms, um, my first stint was in 2018, and I was told, when you're asked to be of service, don't say no. And so... No matter how badly I want to say no, um, that's always stuck with me, and I say yes. And, you know, I can't grow if I don't walk through things that scare me and things that are fearful. So I'm standing up here today um, for just that reason, because I couldn't say no, and I appreciate you asking me to be up here. Um, I wanted to start off, I'm not going to read a bunch out of the big book, I promise. But I wanted to start off with one story that really um, resonates with me and more about alcoholism. Um, One of my nicknames is Jaywalker. And uh, that's a part in the big book. And and, uh, someone with a lot of sobriety that I was introduced to at North Park Fellowship in February of 2018 or March, somewhere in there, um, got to know me really well. And I kept going back to the same... Uh, relationship that I had got in when I was 11 days sober um, with someone that had a lot of time in the program. And that's a whole story in itself, and I'm not really going to get into it, but when they say don't get in a relationship in your first year of sobriety, you know, I didn't listen. And especially with someone with a lot of time, you know, I didn't listen. And um, that took me down a really, really dark road, but I can see the light at the end of the tunnel from all that and everything that I've learned and grown from. And because of that, because I kept going back and it got worse every time, I was nicknamed Jay Walker. So I'm going to read the story. And I just got a new kitten and I named him Jay Walker. (laughs) And my dog's name is Dingus, so I don't know. (laughs) So... Our behavior is as observed and incomprehensible with respect to the first drink as that of an individual with a passion, say for jaywalking. He gets a thrill out of skipping in front of fast-moving vehicles or jumping out of moving vehicles when you're drunk like I did. Um, He enjoys himself for a few years in spite of friendly warnings. Up to this point, you would label him as foolish chap having queer ideas of fun. Bluff then deserts him, and he is slightly injured several times in succession. You would expect him, or me, if I was normal, to cut it out. Presently is hit again, and this time has a fractured skull. Within a week after leaving the hospital, a fast-moving trolley car breaks his arm. He tells you he's decided to stop jaywalking for good, but in a few weeks he breaks both legs. On through the years, this conduct continues, accompanied by his continual promises to be careful or to keep off the streets altogether. Finally, he can no longer work. His wife gets a divorce, and he is held up uh, to ridicule. He tries every known means to get the jaywalking idea out of his head. He shuts himself up in an asylum, hoping to mend his ways. But the day he comes out, he races in front of a fire engine, which breaks his back. Such a man or myself would be crazy, wouldn't I? So I can really resonate with that because that's that's my alcoholism to a T. Um, sober or not, you know, my alcohol wasn't my problem, it was my solution. My problem is Ashley. My problem is my thinking. Um, and that was, that was very evident at a very young age. Um, you know, I... I always wanted to escape. I never felt like I fit in anywhere. Um, I grew up, so my grandpa was a World War II vet. He was a Royal Air Force pilot um, from England. And he, who's seen Gran Torino in here? 
the movie. Okay, so Clint Eastwood sitting out there with his dog, his ice chest, and beer, and his, his packs of cigarettes. That was my grandpa. Um, and he would pour his beers, and I would beg to drink the foam off the top of it as my earliest memories. And I have a picture of myself in a diaper in the kitchen holding a Miller Genuine Draft beer. Um, so it was around all the time. And um, not only was the alcohol around, but the isms. Um, you know, there, I had, I, don't get me wrong, I had a, a really good childhood um, overall. But I was introduced to the way we communicate and get our point across and the way of living is to drink, to yell, to fight physically. Um, my uncle was in high school at the time. My mom had me, I think, when she was 19. And we were all living with my grandparents. And um, there was lots of physical altercations, um, definitely alcohol-induced, and sometimes not alcohol-induced because, again, the isms ran strong in the family. Um, you know, like, there was times when the fights would get so bad that my mom would drive me to the neighbor's house to put me in a safe place and just to get me away from it. And shortly after that, um, my mom met my stepdad and we moved to fish camp, which is just south of Yosemite. There's basically nothing there. And um, my, my parents were uh, volunteer firefighters and they worked at Sinai Lodge at Yosemite. And uh, the restaurant scene and that whole scene is just party. And so I was raised at raging parties where people were drinking dish soap and seeing how many bubbles they could burp up and putting people in suitcases and rolling them down the stairs. And I would be on dirt bikes with people that were hammered. And, you know, that's what I grew up. I learned how to play quarters between the ages of four and six. Um, I grew up in every bar up in the mountain area. So it was always around. Um, but, you know, I, when, when my parents would go on their volunteer calls, they would either wake me up in the middle of the night and leave me at, at our cabin, or they would lock me in the car at the fire station. And so very early on, I developed, that's when I started developing what I now know is, was anxiety and abandonment issues. And, um, I really turned to sports that became my like obsession. Um, comfort for me was watching Sports Center, just having it on in the background, um, watching live games that were on, playing every sport imaginable. Um, that's where I felt I could escape and fit in. And um, I think by the age of six or seven, I started disassociating, which I didn't know what that was at the time. I thought something was really wrong with me, and when I would try to talk to my mom about it, um, I was just dismissed. Oh, just get over it, nothing's wrong with you. Started having panic attacks where I didn't know what they were and thought I was having a heart attack at the age of seven, eight. Um, and it was just, just get over it. And um, so, you know, I started developing lots of fear about everything. Um, but again, sports was everything to me. And so I played every sport I could in school. I got good grades. Um, straight A student, um, went on to high school and continued playing sports. Um, I was offered scholarships pretty much all over the country for basketball, um, but I thought it would be a, a grand idea to just play one year at Fresno City and wait for my boyfriend to graduate because he was a year younger than me. Always have been an issue in my in my story, so this is just the first of many. Um, <laughs> and within two weeks of being at Fresno City, I broke up with him and uh, just finished out that season. And by that time, got in another very toxic relationship um, and was introduced to alcohol. And although I didn't take off fast drinking, you know, I I drank. Heavily, one time, um, got alcohol poisoning, um, more brownout than blackout, but coming to and wondering why there's like throw up all over the living room and all over my PlayStation controllers and getting pissed off at everyone else that was there and they're like, that was you, Ashley. And um, lying to Starbucks, who I worked for at the time, um, 
of some random food poisoning that I had, and it took me four days to get back to work. And I didn't drink again for a while. Um, I then met my, who's now ex-husband, um, and he would pick me up for dates, and I would smell heavy, heavy alcohol on him. Um, but didn't think anything of it, like whatever he had to drink. He was nervous before he came to get me, before our date, you know, whatever. Um, and then learned that he was drinking like three quarters rum with a little bit of coke, like a lot. And uh, I'd have a beer here and there, and then I was like, wait, what is that you've been drinking? Like, let me try that. And that had an effect on me. And that started my um, continual downslide to what got me here, standing here today. Um, started drinking a lot more, having a lot of parties, because once the sports was done, it was like my new identity was partying, and before I met my ex-husband, it was all the boys that I had crushes on in high school were now interested in me and wanted to come to my parties, and it was just, you know, whatever could fill the God-sized hole that I had in me, that void that I always tried to fill, I tried to fill with everything external. Um, I had no concept of like self-care that you could work on yourself and learn how to love yourself and you didn't need someone to complete you and you didn't need external validation to complete you and all that, all the, all the things. Um, so anyways, when, when I started drinking more with him, I would start going to work and I'm like, I think I smell like alcohol in the morning. Like, that's not good. And I'd have a headache and I'm like, these are hangovers. What? I don't like this. But of course, like, I couldn't wait to get my next drink because as soon as I took that first drink, everything that I was uncomfortable with in my own skin disappeared. I could fit in anywhere. I felt on top of the world. I could accomplish anything that I wanted to accomplish. Or so I thought, um, until I couldn't. And then, you know, it just progressed. I had my first blackout, like bad blackout was at age 23. And um, it, was my, it was my 23rd birthday up in Oakhurst at the Oak Room. And everyone was buying me drinks. And I lived up near fish camp at the time. So it's not like you can just walk like, those of you that drank in Fred's know, man, if I drank down here, I don't know if I'd be alive today because <laughs> it, it's a lot easier down here to get alcohol and get to where you need to go, uh, whether walking or riding a bike or short drunk driving episodes, not up there, it's not. Um, and I don't know how I got home. And my ex-husband didn't know how I got home. And I think he was just as drunk as I was, so I was convinced he took me home and he just didn't remember. But either way, it scared me really, really badly. And I called my sheriff buddy and I was like, hey, what are signs that like maybe I was taken advantage of or used or like, and I was like, I'm never doing that again. And that night I picked up a drink and did it again. So no matter what I experienced in my drinking, um, once, I, once I crossed that threshold, I just, I couldn't stop. It didn't matter how bad it was or what I did. Um, you know, the blackouts just, man, they continue to happen and they continue to happen frequently until they happen to every single time. I swore I would never drink more than one beer and drive. <clears throat> then it became two, then it became three, then it became, hey, are you more drunk than me? which one of us is driving. And then it became blackout driving. Um, so, you know, and it talks in the big book about we had tried every imaginable remedy, you know, and I really did try all those remedies. I would get like the little IV liquid packs to put in my water. I would say I'm gonna drink a water in between every beer. I would say I'm only gonna drink Thursday through Sunday morning or at least till the first football games were done, so I'd be okay by Monday. I tried everything and nothing worked. And eventually I was drinking around the clock and I worked, I lived three quarters of a mile from where I worked so I could walk, I could bike, I could ride my dirt bike, it didn't matter. There was no 
worrying about getting a DUI. So, and I was salary and I, I just didn't care. So I would just start drinking and drinking and, and wake up and have to take a drink just, just to function. Um, and that was just an absolutely miserable, miserable existence. Um, the first time that I realized I had a problem, like actual problem, like I might be an alcoholic. So I always joke with my friends, right? Like we're functioning alcoholics, we're good, you know? And because everyone drank like I did, I would only associate with people that drank like I did. And um, now that I'm sober, these friends that I still talk to, like my best friend, uh, Dory, she told me last time she came down to visit, she's like, I've realized over the years that you were the problem. Like, I've never been so hungover or so drunk or anything unless I hung out with you. And I was the one that would push it, push you to drink. Like, come on, shots, everybody. I was a happy drunk. Like, you need to be drinking as much as me or you can go. You know? Um, and one time when I was at Starbucks working, I was really sick in the afternoon. And I went next door to Marisco's and grabbed a beer on my lunch break. The insanity in that, it's like, I'm not allowed to go grab a beer on my lunch break, but it didn't even cross my mind. And I felt better immediately. And I was like, I've become dependent on, on alcohol. Like, this really is an issue. But I didn't care, I just kept going, because there was no consequences other than the spiritual, just absolute emptiness inside when I would come to. I had not yet had any consequences. Um, and that turned into, so my ex-husband was alcoholic, I'm an alcoholic, right? We're both drinking a lot together, but we're both also hiding alcohol from each other because we don't want each of us to know how much the other one's drinking. So I had, I had stuff hidden in a detached garage, these big rocks outside. I mean, it was summer and I would hide, hide IPAs in the sun under rocks and would drink them warm. Like, it didn't matter at that point. That's where my alcoholism took me. As long as I could get something that had alcohol in it, in my body, um, is, what I, is what I did. Um, and that took me to some really, really dark places because I started taking bottles of Jameson, vodka, whatever it was, hiding it in a backpack um, in the back room at Starbucks, um, worked the night shift. And when people weren't looking, I'd sneak back and take a swig off of it. And I would just be hammered by the time I was leaving. And the ex was really on me, even though I know he was drinking the same. Um, when I get home, I smell alcohol on you. I'm like, yeah, I smell alcohol on you too. So where are we at? <laughs> um, I didn't care. I didn't care about what anybody thought about it. All I cared about was getting that in my system so I could function. And... Um, I mean, I heard someone in this room share the other day about a breathalyzer, and uh, it made me think that we started carrying breathalyzers on us to try to see if we were close to the limit so we could drive. That was before we just didn't care, but I would. I would take a breathalyzer and be like, oh yeah, I'm 0 0.07, and then next thing I know, I'm 0 0.18, and I'm like, okay, this, this isn't working. There's no point with this breathalyzer. <laughs> But normal people don't buy breathalyzers and keep them. They just don't. And I thought it was totally normal. I thought I was so cool and responsible. Um, but some other things that happened in my drinking. Jumping out of moving trucks uh, while my ex-husband was stuck running in his mouth. Thought that was a good idea. Ripped open my knee, had to go to the ER, but first I said stop at the liquor store. I don't even remember who took me and why they would allow me to stop at the liquor store after what I just did, but they did. <laughs> Master manipulator. Um, and my guy had my bottle ready for me and he looked at me and I'm all bloody and he's like, all right, and off I go and just getting hammered. I was looking at the videos the other day and I'm like taking videos laughing and then like stitching me up and like, just like it's complete and utter insanity. Um, and only a room full of alcoholics can laugh at all that stuff because normal people would be like, what is wrong with you? Um, a lot, 
<laughs> a lot. Still today, a lot. But I'm working on it. Um, you know, I my so much has to do with my ex husband. Ugh. But he found me choking on my own vomit um, one time. Um, and when he woke me up and rolled me over, um, I was like, we were staying at my uncle's, and my uncle wasn't home. He's got more alcohol than a bar does. And so I just went to the next bottle I could find and kept drinking. And uh, even that wouldn't stop me or deter me from drinking more. Um, and it's just things like that over and over and over again. Um, he'd piss me off and then I'd be like, you can go home. I'm gonna get free drinks from whoever I can get free drinks from and I'm gonna get a ride home from whoever I can get a ride home from. Because I don't want to deal with your crap anymore, and I just want to stay and have fun. Um, again, I'm happy drunk. I just want everyone to party with me and have fun with me. Um, I would even tell some of this the other day, and I had forgotten about it. And so we would all go out, family, friends, everything, and I would I would go up to the bar, kind of give a guy a smile and a little flirt just to get a drink bought for me. Then I'd go take it to, you know, my mom or, you know, a friend. And then I'd go up to the bar and find another guy and be like, hey, you want to buy me a drink? And then I'd go back and give it to someone else. And I would just manipulate, manipulate. And I had bottles in the car so I wouldn't spend money in the bar. And the bottles would be gone. I would get the free drinks and I'd still spend $100 plus at the bar just on myself. It was like, it didn't matter. What plan I put in my head to either save money, drink less, nothing ever worked. It just got worse and worse and worse. And um, man, there's been times where I've been, and drugs are not part of my story. Like literally this is all just alcohol. I can't imagine what it would have been like with other substances as well, because there's times where I've woken up and I've missed four or five days in a row that I was basically Pass out, wake up to the bathroom, don't remember anything, go grab a bottle, drink more, pass back out. And that would go for like five days straight. And I come to you and think, oh, this is Sunday, so it's Monday. No, it's Thursday. And um, that's how bad it got. And um, then I don't like talking about it, but it's part of kind of why I still deal with anxiety and stuff like I do today. But Things got really, really bad, and I had a loaded shotgun held to my forehead, pinned them into the ground, and um, then six months later, um, had to call the cops again and have the SWAT come remove my ex-husband, and um, that was that was in January of 20. That was actually New Year's January, um, 2018, and uh, I I hadn't been drinking, believe it or not. I know you probably don't believe it, but New Year's Eve and I wasn't drinking because I had to be at Starbucks that morning and I was on thin ice with them at that point after calling out so many times and missing morning shifts and uh, I found a handle of Jack Daniels that he had been drinking off of in the, in the closet like I said we hid from each other um, and I thought I would just take that and drink that and drink myself a little and uh, my mom and sister came up and got me and, and uh, I drank for another month um, Till Super Bowl Sunday, I showed up to Starbucks in a blackout at 6 a.m. Um, they tried to put me on the register. I couldn't count money back. They tried to put me on the ovens. I didn't know egg bites from a breakfast sandwich. They tried to put me on bar to make drinks. I couldn't figure out what drink was what. And I don't know how, like, why they kept moving me around, why they didn't just send me home, but they sent me on lunch. And I had a six pack of IPs in the car. So my mom said, you can't drink hard alcohol if you're uh, gonna be staying here. And I'm like, no problem, I'll just hide the hard alcohol. And um, and I'll drink, you know, the highest percentage beer I could get. So if you're letting me drink beer in front of you, you don't know what it's really doing to me because 12%, what you're drinking is like five. So that's what I did. And uh, I guess I put down a six pack of those in my short lunch break and uh, at the Oak Ridge Starbucks, the drive through is goes right in front of the parking spots. And everyone knows everyone in Oak Ridge. And um, I have my car back then. 
So I was facing the drive through line. And uh, I wake up to a knock on the window. And it's my shift supervisor. She's like wondering what happened to you. And I look down and I have six empty bottles strewn across my lap. And I had just been passed out in my car in the drive through So I don't even know how many people saw me that knew me. Um, Today I can laugh about that. I've been to that Starbucks now a few times in the last few months. And the uh, last time we were up there, we even parked in that spot and took a picture. And it's like, yeah, this is where I was passed out. But not today, not today. I'm sitting here sober. Um, so I'm glad I can look back at those things and kind of laugh now. Um, but man, again, a miserable, miserable existence. Um, it took me the rest of that day to drink myself to oblivion, and by Monday, I came to an ambulance. My mom and siblings thought that I had overdosed because um, they didn't know that alcohol could do what it had done to me um, without taking anything else. And then I entered a Kaiser outpatient program because when I was passed out in the hospital, um, my mom did her little sneaky magic and got me signed up for Kaiser outpatient. Um, and that was probably the greatest thing that ever happened actually, because when I got there, they told me that I needed to go to AA. And um, I didn't know what AA was. I thought it was what you see in movies. I thought it's just gonna be a bunch of old dude smoking cigarettes that I couldn't relate with in some nasty room and like homeless and this and that and although some of that's true and I could have been homeless at any point in time I didn't have any of those repercussions but again the spiritual insight that was plenty for me um so I I walked into meeting in Oakhurst and um the first one I was like, man, I don't, I don't relate. And then the second one I was like, okay, I kind of relate. I couldn't say anonymity um, when I read the, <laughs> the traditions and um, whatever I was reading. It, I embarrassed myself trying to say anonymity. So I went home that after that meeting and recorded myself saying it until I got it right because I didn't want to embarrass myself again. Um, cause God forbid I look, you know not perfect um and you know i made it a year and a half that time around i moved down to fresno and got planted at north park fellowship and um everyone there was so welcoming and wonderful and i got a sponsor and i worked the steps and um got a sponsee started working the steps with her um small speaking engagements, not at a podium, um, secretary meetings, just really getting involved in, in learning that alcohol wasn't the problem that I was, um, that my thinking, that my isms, that my spiritual malady um, was the problem. And because um, when I came in, I was like, yeah, I'm powerless over alcohol. Yeah, I have a God of my own understanding. Perfect. This is great. Like, easy. And um, over the last five years, all of it has taken on a completely different meaning. Um, you know, I got in that relationship right, right when I got sober. Um, and he went out after 11 years and at a year and a half, he handed me a beer on the golf course. And I said, sure. And, um, Man, let's just say it was bad. It was really, really bad. And um, it took me a while to get away from that. Um, officially, finally, this last December. And why that's important is because um, it showed me how powerless I can be over more than just alcohol. I mean, I knew I was powerless over people, places, and things to an extent that I couldn't control the world, that I'm not God. But, um, I had made him my higher power and was told I couldn't go to mixed meetings and so I just stopped going to meetings altogether. Um, and so in December when it ended, um, God doing for me what I could not do for myself yet again, 
for the however many time in my life. Um, I wanted to die in sobriety. I didn't want to drink, but I wanted to die. And I was too afraid to kill myself. Um, Cause even in my lowest points of drinking, that was never a thought. So it really wasn't a thought this time. I mean, I remember one time stepping out of my apartment and looking <coughs> over the ledge and going, you know, I just break an ankle or something, you know, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't do enough damage. Um, and then a youth reached out to me that I had so when I was doing my bachelor's in criminal justice at Arizona State. Um, I was doing an internship at Fresno County um, Juvenile Hall. And uh, I had a youth that I had worked with, and I hadn't talked to him in a couple years. He was in Teen Challenge, and so rules and guidelines, I wasn't allowed to talk to him as his case manager through the internship that I was at. Um, but he still had my number, and when he got out, he reached out to me in January. And he said, hey, um, I gotta get a court card signed off. Um, you still go to that meeting over by where we live? And I was like, man, I haven't been in a couple years, but I'm glad to meet you, like I'll happily meet you over there for a new meeting. And um, I did. And I walked back in and I saw so many familiar faces, faces that are sitting here right now that I've known since the beginning of my journey at North Park. And um, even at two years sober, I was sitting in the corner, my hood on, trembling, and I felt like a newcomer, and I looked like a newcomer. And the newcomers in here, if you're wondering what the hell you're doing here, and you're nervous, and you're trembling, you just wanna hide from the world, I totally understand. It does get better. Um, and that first meeting back, I was like, this is where I need to be. This is where people can love me until I can love myself again. This is where I have hope. This is where I connect with my higher power on a deeper level. This, this is the place that is safe and has all the answers to all my problems today. And, um, and I had forgot that, you know, I, I just had turned my back on it. And so ever since then, I've been going to, I don't know how many meetings a week. I have a schedule that allows me to hit most noon and night meetings. So a lot of days I'll do two meetings a day. Um, got a new sponsor, my move to France. Um, so I thought, you know, I should probably have someone in person that can hold me accountable and I can actually meet up with. Um, and she's been absolutely amazing and uh, such a God thing. And I wanted to just completely start over as if I was a newcomer. Um, so, I did, and I started back at step one, and um, I think I'm on like six or seven right now. I'm kind of stalled out at that. On those right now, just life has been lifing a lot. And, um, but when we did my step five, we went to, um, we went up to Bass Lake because it holds a special place for both of us. Um, that's like my favorite place on earth that I've been to so far. I'm sure there's more beautiful, wonderful places, but that place holds a very special, special place in my heart. So we decided to go up there and we may or may not have broke into the Pines Pool area. <laughs> I mean, we, we spent enough time up there and treated it with respect that I don't think we need to make amends for that. But um, we, we went and sat at the Pines Pool and I started doing my fifth step and um, it was sunny when we got up there and then the clouds started rolling in and then we heard thunder in the distance and then the wind picked up and it was blowing the umbrellas, the pool umbrellas into the pool. They were like literally flying through the air and then it started lightning thundering and then it started pouring rain on us. And it, as I was doing my fist step, it was literally washing the ink off of the paper. And if that's not a spiritual experience, I don't know what is. Um, I still get goosebumps talking about it. And it started raining so hard. They were like, okay, let's go back over to the forks and like get dessert and go sit inside. And by the time we got there, I couldn't even, my paper was shredded. Like it was, and that was God just washing it all away, I think for me. And, um, <clears throat> giving me a fresh, clean start. And so, um, 
you know, being back around has just been amazing. And I've never had, like, I talk to so many alcoholics every single day, whether it's in group messages or like Ralph here. And I don't want to call you your name, I call you. <laughs> Rusty <laughs> Poop, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Send me uh, morning, you know, inspirational quotes and things. There's just a lot of people in this room that. I talk to on a daily basis, and um, I'm a secretary of a meeting and supply person for our fellowship, and I just picked up a sponsee, and it's, it's just amazing, like, starting over and going headfirst into the program, and um, the most special thing, let's see if I missed anything that I really wanted to talk about, um, the most special thing is that um, so I never knew my biological father. Um, my mom would never talk about it. When I was in seventh grade, I had a friend come to her and say she was being molested by her stepdad. And I overheard my mom say, I can relate, Ashley was a product of rape. And so I went along life from then on thinking that that's how I was conceived. Um, and my mom would never talk about it. And so as I got older, I got on Ancestry, and I had been on there for over a decade, AncestryDNA.com, and uh, just trying to find my biological father or any family out there. Um, I had a stepdad. I do have a stepdad. I don't know if I should say had. Um, I still call him dad and that family, you know, grandma and grandpa. They were my family growing up but I still wanted to know if I had another family out there. And um, so it was last March of last year, um, I was finishing up my bachelor's, my last class of my bachelor's degree. And I got an email from this 84 year old lady that had been helping me over the last probably four or five years try and trace family lines. And she said, I don't know if this is gonna mean anything to you, but this is what I found. And um, I read it. And it went all the way down to these brothers and then to my dad specifically, um, who lived on the same street as my mom did the year I was conceived. And she said he has a LinkedIn page. So I went to his LinkedIn. He's here in Fresno. He owns a financial advising company. So I found his email at the bottom of his business website and I emailed him and I said, hey, I think you might be my dad. <laughs> yeah, imagine getting that phone call, you guys. <laughs> and uh, if it weren't for alcohol, though, I wouldn't be here today because that's how I was conceived. Because my dad said he got that email. He drinks, but fairly normally. And he's like, I was just sitting down to have a cold uh, Heineken watching March Madness, and I get this email, and he calls his brother, and he tries to pin it on his brother, and his brother was like, I was in seventh grade, bro, like, no. And he calls his college buddy, who's his memory bank, because he doesn't remember half of this stuff from then, because of the drinking, and uh, says, yeah, yeah, you, you dated her for a bit. And so, um, he called me, that was a Thursday, he called me on a Friday, we got to talk, Got to share my story, got to share that I'm sober. And he's like, sorry kid, about the nose and the alcoholism. And I was like, thanks dad. <laughs> we talked, but we talked and talked and, and you know, come to find out he had been with my mom. And so on Saturday I met him and my stepmom. They all live here in town. Um, and they lived up there when I lived up there in the mountains. And we've been in the same location probably a hundred times in my life without knowing it. Um, Met him, my stepmom, and my, and my half-brother, and then on Sunday met all the family, uh, grandparents, cousins, aunt, uncle, went to church with them, um, and then did a paternity test on Tuesday, and by the following Friday, got the results back. He's like, well, we're at Crow and, Crow and Wolf, I don't know if you're comfortable coming out there, I've had a few, you know, and I was like, no, I'll come celebrate. And uh, so I found my biological father and this amazing family that I have today. And, um, and he said it was God's divine timing that he wouldn't have been fit to be a good father to me if I had found him 15, 20 years ago. 
and I wouldn't have been a good daughter to him if he had found me or if I had found him before me getting sober. And so we're both very grateful for where, you know, the timing of when I've met him. Um, and it was really special when I when I turned three. Um, he came to the meeting, him and my stepmom, to the birthday meeting, and he presented me with my three-year chip. Um, I get to have lunch with him tomorrow, and I see him every week, and it's just absolutely amazing. And none of it could be possible without this program, which gives me sobriety, which gives me sanity, um, which gives me the ability to just take part in life and not have to do it with drinking. And um, I'm just so grateful for what this program has done for me um, and what it's going to continue to do for me. Um, I'm just a baby, you know, I'm just a baby. And I can't wait to see, you know, as long as I keep going to meetings and work in the program and being of service, the triangle is so imp important, service, unity, and recovery. Um, you know, if I keep doing what I'm doing, then I have a good shot at waking up sober tomorrow. And if I do the same thing tomorrow, mm -hmm. I have a good shot of waking up sober the next day. And the days will just continue to add up. And uh, I'm just very grateful that God got me back in the rooms and I survived all the things that I don't think I should have survived. He obviously has a purpose for me. And last thing I'll say is I just got accepted into the master's program for social work. Mm -hmm. And I said I would never go back to school. I've stopped learning to say never because God always has a different plan and it keeps very humorous that way. Um, but his plan got me here and uh, I'm eternally grateful. There's enough. I, I live my whole life being a service to AA and never give back what it's already given to me. So I just want to thank you for being here and listening. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.